You are listening to The Cycling Podcast with Lionel Burney, Daniel Freeb, and Richard Moore. How you doing, Mitch? Good, mate. Yourself? Yeah, not bad. Not bad. This is Simon, our photographer. Hey, Simon. Hi. Nice to meet you. So where are we going to go? We're going to go to a little local that you, where I used to live, actually. It's called the Taverna. I feel there. It's like in a nice square. It's actually in the square of Plaza Constitution where two years ago, October 1, happened here. The first, not the first, but the biggest sort of rebellion in the whole Catalonia breaking free. This was the spot where they went. So now they've renamed that square, I think October 1. <laughs> but the bar we're going to is awesome. It's just open all the time. You can sit outside, good canyas. It's away from the beaten track. So And it's and it's off season, so you can have a beer, right? Exactly. So well let's go then. Let's do it. My name is Lionel Burney and for this episode of the Cycling Podcast I travelled to Girona in Catalonia to meet a professional cyclist. That's not difficult to do because Girona is home to a sizeable breakaway of riders. But I was there specifically to see Mitch Docker, the 33-year-old from Melbourne, Australia, whose career has seen him evolve from sprinter to lead-out man to classic specialist to road captain to podcaster, but more of that in due course. Docker came to Europe just over a decade ago when he got a contract with the Skill Shimano team. In the last of three seasons with Skill Shimano, he was sixth at Ghent Wevelgem, a race that was won by Tom Bonin. He then joined Orica Green Edge and spent six years there before switching to EF Education first. The 2020 season will be his 12th in the European peloton. Since 2016, Docker has hosted his own podcast, Life in the Peloton, and ahead of a collaboration between him and the Cycling Podcast, we wanted to put him on the other side of the mic and ask him the questions for a change. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport. fueled by science. The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport and as ever, all our listeners can get 25% off the Science in Sport range at scienceinsport.com with the code SISCP25. There's a full range of energy bars, hydration drinks, protein supplement, recovery drinks, everything to help you prepare for your race or ride, keep you going all the way to the line and help you recover for the next ride. So go to scienceinsport.com and once you've filled your basket, enter the code SISCP25. The code is not compatible with any other offers. Now, let's head to a pleasant square in Girona on a mild late autumn evening where I sat down for a post-season beer with Mitch Docker. Well, cheers, Mitch. This is a lovely spot here. We're in early November. I mm. forgot that not everywhere is rainy and cold in early November like um, England. I brought my big coat to Girona, and I'm not going to need it, am I? <laughs> you probably won't, no. like Even though it's like any environment you're in, you become adjusted to it. So we're finding it cold here now in a nice way. It's autumn in a nice way. It's You get a little rainy day every so often. It gets crisp at night, and it feels nice to put a coat on. Opposed to, I guess, you, who's always having to throw a coat on, so it gets a bit tiresome. Well, I've, I'm just here in a t-shirt. I mean, this is this is crazy. But you'll be off to Australia in a couple of days. Are you flying? Tell me about your route back home for for the winter slash summer. Well, the flight itself is a pretty boring thing. You know, you fly. We fly with Singapore, so you got to do a little cheeky stop over Barcelona, Milan, sit on the plane for an hour, and then go across to Singapore and Singapore back to Melbourne. Um, that's the boring part of it. We got two kids, so that's going to be maybe not so boring what age are your children my son's two and a half and my daughter's six months Ooh. so yeah that's a but challenging she, flight long she's long. an angel so I'm, ah. I'm expecting she's going to be good and my son's just going to be red hot how do you divide duties as road captain and your <laughs> wife the other road captain uh you know actually it was funny when i'm thinking about that my my daughter when my daughter was born she was tough just as a normal um newborn and it was, Marlo was my son. He was, we we're both fighting to take care of him. Like, oh, I'll take Marlo out. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll take Marlo for a walk. No, I'll, I'll put him to bed. It's like, but now it's flipping again. Esther's becoming really comfortable and 
S is my daughter, and now it's a bit like, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give her a bath. You feed Marlo, you know. So <laughs> I think we're just going to have to juggle it up and look over across at each other and see who's doing it tougher and go, all right, I'll tag in. A bit like a, a Madison. You know, it is. tagging your wife in for a stint while you maybe uh, get 15 minutes sleep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I sympathise. But being an Australian working nine months a year in, in Europe, um, I guess it's an occupational hazard. And you want, you want to get home, of course. It's funny, yeah, you do. And I can live here. I really do feel like I can live here in, in Spain or in, in Europe. I really do love the atmosphere, the life, the lifestyle. It's a breath of fresh air. It's a different take on life than Australia. Not that Australia has a bad take, but it just brings another element into it. But it's the family. I really miss that my extended family, my mum and dad, my sister and my brother. And when you get to that point, you don't feel it. I think after we've been here for a long time, you're fine. You can coast through the year. You're not thinking of home too much. You get settled. You've got your family, your little family. But as soon as you have that date that you're going home, and as soon as it draws close, say inside a month, all of a sudden it can't come quick enough. And um, I've had that feeling the last week. It's like... God, these last days are dragging on. But, you know, months before, it didn't matter. You could have been here all year. It wouldn't have matter. Well, the cycling podcast is taking up an hour of your evening. You know, you'll, you'll be getting on the plane before you know it. And, and, of course, when you get back to Australia, you're going to have to adjust to the heat, I guess. It'll be pretty warm down there. Um, what's a kind of typical Aussie summer for the Dockers like and, and, and Christmas, of course? And then mm. returning to racing in, what, two months and a bit, I guess? It is crazy. You say the two months. I'll I'll touch on that because I was talking to someone the other day and I was like, well, actually, we're up in Andorra driving through. And I was reminiscing on the Andorra stage. I was like, well, that was just two months ago. I was talking to Luke Durbridge and he goes, you know, nationals are in two months. And I was like, nationals feel ages ago and the Vuelta feels like two seconds ago. Yet they're exactly the same time apart in, in this point of the year. So I haven't got my head around racing yet. And I think that's okay. How long have you been off since your last race then? I've been off since I did a race um, that was 10 days after the Worlds. I've been off for about, must be about three weeks now. I'm still going to have another couple of weeks off. I'm going to have a bit of a longer off season this year. And Tour Down Under is starting a little bit later this year. So just taking that into my advantage. And I'm just understanding as I get older the demands of a whole season, what it takes to get myself going and how many mental matches I have. And I do need this time. And also, my off-seasons are different to when I was younger too. They're pretty full-on with the family, which I like. And I don't feel like I lose a lot of fitness. So getting that fitness back comes a little easier. It's just about the mental side of things. So you don't feel kind of guilty. Have, have you touched a bike have you, or have you really had some proper time off? I've actually been on the bike a little bit, yes. I've been doing a bit of gravel stuff on a cross bike. We had a little of a little event organised for Swain Tuft, a little send-off, a three-day adventure. We did that up in Andorra or just around the Pyrenees, which was unbelievably hard but unbelievably satisfying and just an awesome three days. So we, we did a little bit of preparation for that too. By What I mean by that is just riding once a week just to test the material. He's a real man of the natural world, isn't he? Where do you fit on that? scale i've got a feeling you're a bit more kind of towards the urban end of the scale than than that i don't know yeah like i think i was and probably still am i'm from melbourne and mum and dad live not too far from the center of melbourne we're by no means in the center um but we're definitely by no means in the country just in the suburbs and when i I bought a place in melbourne a few years ago and it was in a place called an area called northgate which is about three or four k from the center and i really envisioned myself living in that area cool area in the north of melbourne my sort of scene I really love that area still but things have changed as I've got older and I just can't imagine myself living there I love the area I love going there but I can't live in the city anymore I think that's happened because of living overseas maybe in a small city or small town like Girona or even up in Andorra and understanding what I really value in life and time is the time with the family and being outdoors with you know being on that trip with Swaino also showed me a lot about what I love and also maybe he pushed the limits of what is too much for me. I enjoyed doing that, but I also noticed in myself that it's not something I want to do every day. Were you camping out? We weren't. That would have been too far. Right. Way too far. <laughs> so Just, you, you had a bit of comfort in the evening and a, we and did. a, and and a that beer was, and a nice meal. Yeah, yeah. We, we had many a beers. Yeah. And the meals were just really rustic, but they were beautiful because, you know, after you do something like that, 
It sort of doesn't matter. Even if you were camping, we were discussing this on the trip. When you go camping, and I'm sure everyone knows this fact, you go out camping, it's a hard day, it's raining, or you put your tent up. It actually doesn't matter what you're eating. It's like the best meal in the world. You're having beans and rice. You're like, oh, how good are these beans and rice? I love this. I'm going to make this every night when I go home. When you go home, because you've got all these options, of course you don't make beans and rice. So it was a bit like that, except we are staying in refugees. And they were just basic Catalan meals. Beautiful. And we had a bottle of red and a few beers and woke up the next day super sore from the day before and just got into it. Does a trip like that remind you of what got you interested in cycling? What made you fall in love with cycling in the first place? Because... You know, the, the, the pro road season, it, it, it's so regimented these days, I guess. But to, to be able to cut loose and go off the beaten track, literally, it must be quite nice to reconnect in that way. I don't know if it is. I was just thinking about that then when you said that. I don't know if it is reconnecting for me. I think what I fell in love with cycling in the beginning and what I love about cycling now are two different things. I originally started cycling because my dad used to watch the Tour de France, and I love that. But I didn't really know much about it. I was playing cricket and rugby. And we went to the 2000 Olympic Games and we were put in the ballad like every other Australian and we just got random events. And one of the events was the Madison, well, the Madison night at the track. And I got to witness Australia only won one gold medal on the track and it was the Madison with Scott McGrory and Brett Aiken. And that night was properly erupting. You know, just before that was um, Gary Newon got second in the Kieran and really got pipped on the line, attacked the bike. And I remember walking away from that night going, what the hell was that? That was unbelievable. I didn't know anything about track racing. I I knew about Tour de France. I don't remember the moment, but I'm pretty sure Dad was like to Dad, is there a velodrome or something around us that I can do? And Dad was working all around Melbourne. He said, there is a, a track near us, Brunswick Velodrome. I've seen a sign there. They do a Sunday clinic. Let's go down on a Sunday and check it out. And so I went down there on a Sunday, which is a fantastic clinic where they've got all bikes for anyone to just come down and try out. And it was a really good way to get into it because you didn't have to commit anything. You could just try it out one weekend. If you didn't like it, you hadn't bought a bike and whatever, and you were fine. And really novice, you know, Nick's with a T-shirt and a helmet on, no judgment. It's probably, it's changed a bit now. The track has been done up and as cycling's gone in Australia, it's changed a bit, but still the same ethics. And I think I fell in love with cycling back then for the racing side of things. As a young kid, I think every kid who has a BMX races his mate around the block and actually have a number on and be good at racing from the start. I remember winning a race or two and then they said to me, oh, you're pretty good. Should you, you should come to the road after the summer, come and race the road in the winter. And when I think about it now, that was what attracted me. The competition, the... I'm naturally a very competitive person. That's, I would be, wouldn't be here if I wasn't. And the competitiveness of racing got me into cycling. And just to think about what you said then, what I noticed many years later is when I had a crash in Paris-Roubaix um, in 2016. 16? Yeah, I think it was, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. I've said this before, as... What that allowed me to do was have a pause on cycling and make me actually sit back and realise, why am I doing this? And why do I love it? Do I love it? You know, those questions I could I could actually sit back and go, do I actually love this or am I just doing this because I'm getting a wage and I thought this is what I want to do? And it was at that moment, I went riding. I had no program. I had no pressure from anyone. I went riding up in Andorra and just realize looking around the mountains as I was unfit I loved riding up the mountain going I just love riding and I think that was that transition and now when you speak about Swaino's ride that's what I love about cycling now and that's been a big transition over my career one podcaster to another I, I came into this with a kind of a, a, a conversation arc that I was going to follow and, and and we've already deviated off that we've gone off the beaten track but one of the things I wanted to ask you about was that crash in Paris Bay because I remember the pictures um, it was in the forest of Arenberg wasn't it 2016 I gather you don't remember a great deal about the crash but the, the photographs were pretty shocking you were completely covered in blood 
from sort of the nose downwards, really. Mm. And you really, well, tell me what the injuries were. And, 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 and I, I wanted to ask whether, you know, when you go through the trauma of something like that, in the name of the job and the sport that you're, you're doing, you know, that re-evaluation of, uh, do I really want to be doing this? And, uh, well, you kind of answered the question, but, t- but tell me about the, the, the crash itself. And, and did you ever, at that point, think, is this actually worth it? You know, the physical, the physical cost of that was significant, right? It was, yeah. Um, I'll run you through the crash. As far as I remember, it was just a race situation. The bunch split on the sector before. It's a wet, there was a crash, and the bunch split. And Roubaix is a race I love. Every season aspired to do something there. All the way back, I had a result there, a result, a top 20 result. That's a result in Paris Roubaix. Yeah, it is. If anyone knows it, it sort of yeah. is. And I was, I was a young guy in school, Shimano, and I sort of went, maybe I can do something in this race. And then it started, the Roubaix love, you know. So the bunch split, and I was like, hang on, this is not supposed to happen here. Arenberg's coming up. The peloton, the front part of the peloton, were in sight. Like, I mean, 200 metres in sight. And I could see them. If anyone knows the run into Arenberg, it's a big, long straight in. And you could see the bunch. So I was just sitting in my second bunch thinking, all right, what am I going to do here? When we hit Arenberg, I'm going to go across to the front on Arenberg because the bunch sort of spreads out quite a long way. And you can, if you're strong enough, you can latch on to the next group or that's what I thought. And I think what happened is I hit Arenberg with a lot of anticipation and just went for it. And it was quite wet. It rained that night. And everyone was wondering if it was going to be a rainy, a wet Roubaix. And I think all the grass was quite wet in between the stones. And I just lost it. I lost the front wheel and my hands never got down. So my, my face was the first thing to hit the stones. Um, and you knocked a few teeth out? I, I broke the front four of my teeth. Um, I cut my tongue in half cut all around my eye um that's where all the blood sort of came from from the top of my face and if if anyone says my whole face is covered in red blood um and i remember yeah i remember that moment going to arenberg and then what i remember is getting pulled being in the mud on the side of the stone so i don't remember that sort of couple minutes in between and i remember asking the people who were talking to me there i can't even i can't remember seeing anything I think I can only put this vision together because I've seen it. But I remember just asking someone, my teeth, are my teeth okay, you know? And they're like, oh, yeah, mm. just, just, you know, they're calming me down. <laughs> they, they didn't want to tell you. There's a few amazing things about that crash is, one of them is being in the, ho- in the hospital that night and being told that your teammate who had crashed in the early classics opening weekend who was, wasn't even going to be a starter at Roubaix, started Roubaix, that's already the first amazing thing, got in the break and won Roubaix. And I, I couldn't actually comprehend it that night. And I remember telling the story of the lady telling me at the hospital, she was telling me, and I'm like, what's this lady going on about? She's like telling me that Matt Heyman won Roubaix. I'm like, yeah, I know Ru- Heyman was in Roubaix. I know that. She was telling me in this broken English. And I'm like, okay, I get it. And she kept telling me over and over. I'm like, I think she's actually trying to tell me Heyman won Roubaix. Because I didn't know that knowledge until she told me that night after surgery. It was an amazing thing to hear. The second thing which we can go on to is my thoughts after that crash, which we touched on before. It, it really did give me a chance to assess where I was at in my career. I mean, how do they put you back together again? And I mean, that, I mean... No one wants to land on the Arenberg on, on their face, do they? But, I mean, it's part of the, the, the hazard of actually taking part in Paris-Roubaix. The, the risk you take just by being on the start line, you sign up for that, I guess. Yeah, it's one of those races that it's a love-hate with that race. There's that risk. When you start to understand that risk is maybe time to step away from that race. It's got to be one of those races where you go into it, like I said, where, like I went into Arenberg. I wasn't thinking about crashing Arenberg. I was thinking about going across. How, how was it when you went back then? Did you, did you have any flickers of, of doubt, of, of hesitation? The weird thing was, the year I went back, the next year I went back, actually what happened was my bike broke, my chain came off and got completely wrapped around on the first sector. Because you went, you went back the following year, yeah, didn't you? you, you yeah. yeah. And I got a spare bike from the team and the team car had to go ahead and just follow the guys in front. So I got left out at the back. And I was on my own from sector one to the end. 
And that was a different story because I was determined to finish that race. But ultimately, I had no demons to overcome because I was on my own the whole race. And that was a really sad moment too because I remember actually breaking into tears at the end of that race going, I hate this race. You know, like, defeat me the year before and this happens the next year. Give me something, you know. So you rode the whole race off the back with all the spectators sort of turning away from having watched yeah. the race go past. If you've ever been to Paris-Roubaix, you'll know just what it's like, particularly when people are hopping from sector to sector. There's often public traffic in there as well. You're kind of slaloming your way through a, a, a race that's not quite still a bike race in some places, I guess, but you just determined to get to the velodrome. Yeah, and it was, I think it was a process I had to go through. It was a very emotional ride that, year, that day or that year. I was pissed off at a lot of people. I was pissed off at the team for leaving me behind. I was pissed off at the bike, I was pissed off at the race, and then I was happy to be in the race, and I was happy to finish the race on my own, in time. You know, in that time, I think I lost 20 minutes on my own, and I was like, what sort of day was I on? I was, I was a machine, you know? <laughs> if, if only I'd been in the race, you know? Like, if only. That's the thing, but it's a different thing when you're in the race. Kind um, of the, the, the best ride that never was, almost. Exactly. I, I like to think of it. O- only cycling can do that, really, though. Yeah. I, I, can you think of another sport where, you know, you can have that kind of experience, where you're giving absolutely everything to finish and just get your name on the results? I can only think like a marathon or something, you know? But I think one, one significant thing, thing out of that crash was, I think it must have been two, two years ago, I did it, and I hadn't felt any fear from that crash until this moment. And we came off that sector before, Wales it's called, and there was a crash, and the, belt, the bunch split. And I was behind that crash. My teammate, Sebastian Langeveld, was in that crash. And I weaved around it, sort of looked down at him, checked he was okay, and then kept going on. I was the bunch was split. I didn't think anything of it. I was calm, and we came down. We're going down to Ar- to Arenberg, and I was like, "All right, the bunch is just there. I'm going to try and going. Oh, hang on a second. Whoa, deja vu. What the hell? I was going to try and go across, and all of a sudden I started in the position like five in that our group, and I slowly went back, and I just was holding. I was riding, but I was just coasting. And the guys around me were putting pressure on the pedals and they were trying to go across. And I was just, I started and I finished last in our group and I came off. And at that moment then I went, it's okay now. I could see it was like the moment, you know. So you'd survived Arenberg. I mean, it's pretty terrifying. I I mean, I've not raced it, but even just riding off the main road, you know, through past those houses and and it's slightly downhill, isn't it? And you, you, you do hit it pretty quickly. Um, fortunately, the, the slope of it takes some of the sting out. But um, because it's straight, there's no, there's no holding back from anyone, is there? And the stones, they're just, they're ridiculous. They're so ridiculous. It's it just every, every stone on there stops you. Is yeah. it the most, ext- it's probably the most extreme thing you do all year, the, um, the back sure. section? Yeah, easily, by far. There's nothing that compares to that. You know, like, there's a couple of sectors in the Flandern races flatter sectors that are hard and you go this is close to a Roubaix sector a Roubaix sector but you're never mentioning anything in Arenberg and people like to say you know Carrefour de Labra is a five star sector as well it is a five star sector but if you could say Arenberg is a six it's easily a six you know like you said it's got the uphill it's straight and the stones are just another there's no way to escape it go on the sides and just falls away. It's dangerous going on the sides. You mows are right in the middle on the rough stones. Shoot, uh, shoot at l'arrière du peloton. Cycling podcast, team car, at the back of the pack, please. That's Seb Piquet, the voice of Radio Tour at the Tour de France, to remind us to tell you that this episode is supported by the Watt Bike Atom. Now, you might think that the Watt Bike Atom is just for road cyclists, but we're going to hear from someone who had slightly different objectives. So let's hear from a Watt biker who used the Atom in conjunction with the Full Gas app to prepare for the mountain bike event, the Passeport du Soleil in the French Alps. And in the process, he transformed his fitness and lost weight. Hi, I'm Paul Downton. I've been using the Watt bike for around 18 months now um, with the primary goal of improving my overall fitness as well as my performance on the bike for climbing um, mountain biking primarily, as well as giving me confidence to achieve greater rides. As a mountain biker, uh, riding almost entirely on road, the motivation, I think, has come 
primarily out of the results. I think that in seeing how the indoor training related to how I felt when I did go mountain biking with the extra power, the fact that, I mean, hills are never easy. I'm not, I've never been a great person for enjoying the hills. Just putting the miles in in the week, at the weekend, that transformation of performance and power that kind of just drives you to realise that actually this this is really quite awesome in terms of how much difference you can make by just three times a week doing an hour on, on the Watt bike um, with some decent rides. When you see those benefits when you do ride outdoors, it's been very motivational. And also, see, yeah, just seeing those performance improvements. The difference it's made year on year is that there's obviously the increase in the mileage. If I look, look two years back in the years 17 to 18, I'd I'd only done a few hundred miles and, and year on year I've done a thousand more miles of riding than I did the year before. And then the physical aspect of it, it's helped me lose weight, which is always a good thing. That also makes you faster. It's the difference of being able to ride longer, further and being able to climb more. So there's a ride I did recently that um, I had a pre what bike time and obviously a post what bike time um, and it, it cut my total ride time by an hour and a half. So seeing that kind of improvement um, from a physical perspective of being able to ride further, longer, higher has made a massive physical impact. For more information on the Watt Bike Atom or to purchase from just £76 per month, visit wattbike.com. That's wattbike.com, W-A-T-T-B-I-K-E.com. Well, Mitch, here we are outside La Taverna. I'm very English in my T-shirt here. You're kind of in a, 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 a sweatshirt. Most people are in, some people are in coats here. This is obviously Spanish winter, isn't it? But we heard the bells there at seven o'clock. It's now coming up to quarter past seven. I'm just wondering whether they're going to do a, 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 an on the quarter hour ding of the bells as well. Minimum quarter of the hour, minimum. Like it's Girona. Well, I think Europe in general, because we don't get a lot of bells in Australia. It's a, <laughs> they just like to, you know, let everyone know there's a church around the corner. Um, and sometimes this church in front of us, because I used to live around the corner from here, just lets you know it's, you know, 6.13 at night. And it's going to go for 10 minutes. Perfect, perfect. Well, sorry about that, listeners. If you hear the bells, you'll, you'll know that's why. We're just sit, sitting in the square here. We came around the corner, and um, my impression of Girona is that two-thirds of the peloton live here. And, well, I wasn't disavowed of that impression, because as we turned around the corner, there were Taylor Finney and Cassia Nuvadoma just uh, having a, a, a pre-dinner beer. And then Sam Bewley... Um, your former teammate from, uh, well, when you wrote uh, Orica Green Edge, uh, he was there as well. I mean, you know, this is, uh, this is a place to meet cyclists, even in the off-season. It is, and I, I think I was saying to you, like, on the way here, this is a favourite little bar because there's a lot of locals that come here, and anyone who's not local that comes here are friends of mine or people I like to see. That was exactly the case. We came around the corner and it was nice because we're heading off in a couple of days and I got to say some goodbyes to some good friends. Taylor's going to stay in town though, I guess. Um, he's obviously recently announced his retirement from, from cycling. Uh, you know, a, a great talent, but uh, a great talent compromised by another pretty bad crash. A, a, well, a very bad crash. Um, do you know him very well or, or is just an acquaintance, someone you see around town? No, we've really got on well. Like I didn't know Taylor at all before I joined the team EF. And we just hit it off straight away. Um, I found him to be really open and honest. And I like to think of myself as an open and honest person. I think that was just the thing that connected each other. You know, just we're able to speak to each other, during, especially during that early season and classics period. It's quite a tough period psychologically. And to have someone there you can open up to. And I felt like that with him. And I think he felt like that with me in our first season together. We weren't talking big stuff. We are just talking your general issues of the day. And um, even within teams, it can become a little bit of a highly strung competition thing. Everyone wants to do well, and even you want to do better than your own teammates in a competitive world. So to have someone there, you can just sort of say, hey, actually, I was suffering today out there, to admit that to someone. And um, some teammates you don't want to admit that to. So 
with him it was great because we hit it off like that and we could talk honestly and it just sort of um, grew from there. That's interesting. You you kind of you you can be honest with some people, but not honest with others, even though you're going through the same thing in the races. Yeah, I think I think within teams is that hierarchy thing, and obviously you know people who are above you, but people on the same level than you, you want to appear that comfortable and strong, because ultimately they might take your position in the next race or get an, another role that you wanted or it's just an I think a natural competition thing it's a healthy competition it's not like you're trying to dog them in a way but you just want to seem like you know yeah I was good out there you're you not know? gonna you're not gonna go downstairs and tell Charlie Wagalius or Tom Southern that your roommate's not going too well no just- no <laughs> like you just want to be you want to seem you know like in that tough bit you just got through it that slightly bit better than him you know you both admit that it was tough but it wasn't that tough <laughs> yeah. yeah it's a funny thing I mean how do you find I've asked a lot of riders this that, you know you're, you're you know you're in your late 20s or early 30s and you're, you're sharing a room with an, with another man at the end of a, a really tough day's racing I mean it's quite an unusual world isn't it I, I'm, I don't know whether sports people in other sports when they I mean they, they're not quite on the road as much as professional cyclists are are they but the room sharing things always puzzled me a bit I can't th- I think that would crack me. I'd need my own space at the end of the day. It is hard. It's very, very hard. And it takes a lot to understand what you need in a race to get you through and really being very quick to understand that. For instance, come on a bus at the end of the race and you're very emotional and you can say things or do things that you don't actually mean. So it's very important to understand that moment of, okay, I need to just tune out and get myself back to normal and then come back to the group I guess I'm speaking about myself now this could be different for everyone so I, one thing I've noticed is when I come on the bus I need to just sort of let the race sink in 20-30 minutes okay let's come back to the group and then talk about the race or whatever needs to be discussed when it comes to the room it'd be nice to be able to choose your roommate every time but at the end of the day you just get who you're given sometimes and also understanding then what you need in a room. Some guys love to chat all the time. Some guys just are very introvert and just put their headphones on and just be on their laptop watching movies. I think I like something in between. I don't like someone to talk my ears off the whole night because I'm just like, all right, dude, I need to tune out for a second. But also I do like that interaction. You know, I don't want to be in a room on my own. And I think back some of the, my best roommates along the time, that was what we had, that combination. But yeah, you don't like I said, you don't always get that, so you just sort of roll with it and understand what everyone needs. What's it like? I mean, I'm thinking back to the Vuelta, the day that Rigoberto Uran crashed, and, and I mean, you were, well, I was there with my microphone, and, and you've just ridden 180k, and the team leader has fallen as a result of a, a moment's just inattention or just a mistake or whatever. You were clearly feeling pretty bad about that, and would have had every right to just kind of walk past and, and go on the bus. Yet you did stop and you talked about that moment, and I that that's that actually stayed with me from from the race because to admit that publicly mm. um, w- struck me as quite um, well. It, it, it took something that, again, I'd, I'm not sure I would have. I'd want to kind of uh, hide from my mistake, really. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I don't really know how to answer that, why I did that, because I guess this is my personality. Um, I guess I was feeling bad about that, and I just sort of wanted to be like, you know what, that's, that happened. I might as well admit it. And you're probably one of the first person I'd spoken to. On the bike, you didn't get a chance to speak to anyone. The race went on, and I had that thought to go over for whatever it was, two, three more hours after that crash. And yeah, I got off the bike and you were right there. So you were lucky. It came straight out, you know. <laughs> Maybe that was inexperience and I shouldn't have said that. But no. I don't know. I think people, um, I saw how people responded to that. You know, that kind of moment of honesty of, of, of you know, you're you're there to do a job and and, and just the, the rawness of, I mean, you could tell from the tone of your voice, you, you felt pretty bad about that. Mm. And, and that must have been a pretty tough evening. The funny thing was like, I actually sort of built that up the more than it was. And as soon as I saw Rigo, it was just like, nah, crashes. You know, like, and this is his character too. They happen all the time. What I saw in that crash was he was looking at me going, I can't believe you just crashed me. That's what I saw in his eyes. But he was looking at me going, I can't believe I've crashed. Not you, but I've crashed again. And I was, and that's more or less what he relayed to me. And I was like, you know what? Exactly. 
wasn't my fault. These things happen all the time. Well, it takes two to tango, doesn't it? Exactly. I mean, if somebody uh, hits your back wheel, it's you know, it's uh, it's uh, you know, it's not just one person's actions that I guess. But in terms of um, the role that you found in professional cycling, you know, from those days when you you love the kind of competitive nature of the racing and and you you won races and and then you get into this world of european cycling the first job is you have to stay in it don't you you get your your contract your two-year contract whatever it happens to be you have to do enough to get another one and i wonder how you kind of you went about doing that and, and when you kind of realized what your role in the peloton was going to be it's a conversation i have quite often and i i put it down to and i didn't realize i was doing this but you have to evolve and you have to understand quickly, very quickly, what teams want or need. And let go of what you want to a degree. Look, and that's different for everyone. Like, I'm not going to say that to a, a race winner sprinter. If he suddenly lets go of that and just tries to do something else, he's probably not going to get a contract. That's what he's good at. He needs to hang on to that. But I think in my case, I understood that, okay, I was very good at doing lead outs but then all of a sudden, they also need a guy who can do lead outs that get over climbs. So it's like, okay, I need to evolve into that rider. I need to involve, evolve into a guy that can ride the front as well. I can't just be one dimensional because all of a sudden the team goes, you know what, if you can't do this as well, we're going to get someone else that can do this and that. So you've got to keep evolving and you've got to keep realizing what the teams need or move yourself to a team that needs you. Um, it's, it's much easier said than done. I think a lot of riders don't realize the fact that and they get caught up in I'm just that rider and we're very versatile most riders are to a degree and it's just showing the teams that you can do more than one thing and also hone and training it and honing your training a little bit to that as well so when you were back in Australia riding for the Drapak team and and I guess you would have ridden with Tom Southam for at least one year maybe but that was a you know that was a development team that would would get out of Australia and do other races as well at that point were you looking to Europe looking to try and get over to um, you know ride in the the races you'd seen on TV yeah I think like it was the big dream and I had a real big reality shock the dream was to go pro turn professional and I was doing my university at the same time. That was the, the ethos of the team in those days. Yeah, what, what were you studying? Nutrition and food science. It was a Bachelor of Science. I was sort of doing both at the same time. And then the year that I graduated, I was lucky enough to ride Tour de Lavenir and the World Championships. And that was enough to get me a contract in School Shimano. But that was sort of what I realized after that was, that was the end of my goal setting process. Whether I realized that was a, I was setting goals, but that was my goal to become professional to finish university and suddenly I came across the Europe my first year professional and it was just like I struggled I really struggled in Australia I'd been the top of the cream of the crop I'd been doing well and you came in your bottom of the rung I had no more goals I didn't know really know what the the level was going to be I didn't know what I was doing I was just floating but I was really floating at the bottom getting smashed every week and I really do remember this clearly coming home after that first year and I had a gym trainer and I went and saw him at the gym and we used to have breakfast after it was really early 5am in the morning in the gym we'd go have breakfast afterwards sitting there having breakfast I said to him Whale his, his name's Andrew and his nickname is Whale I said Whale he's like how was it how was the year you know fully g you're pro I was like mate I'm done I said that's great, you know, I was over there living in Holland. I got two-year contracts, I'm going to go see that out, but that's it. Like, it's not for me. Like, it's just too hard. I'm not even, I can't even finish a race. Like, the classics were just, I was last and I just got smashed up the first cobblestone climb, dropped, cold, whatever. And I'm like, this is crap, I hate this. And I remember this, he's just like, mate, you've done the hardest part. You're there. You need to set some goals for next year. And go back, you're there. Every guy wants to get over there. You're already at that step. Now you just got to go from there. And he didn't have any idea about the European season. He just understood that I had no goals set that year, so I was just floating. And I remember setting these, these ridiculous goals that next year. I wrote down in my book, you know, three race wins. Going from, like, not even finishing a race. So a race win was just, like, well and truly out of the, the realm. And all of a sudden, I got this race win. And I was like, what? I can't believe this. I, I won this sprint against Tyler Farrar and Graham Brown. 
And then the next week, I won another race. I'm like, what the hell? I I'm remember. I've only got to win one more. Yeah, I remember <laughs> looking back at my diary and seeing three race wins, and I wrote two race wins. I'm like, I didn't get the third, but I, it was just unbelievably mind blowing. Was that because you kind of unlocked a part of your brain that maybe this will be possible if you write it down? You know, the, the cliche is if you if you see it, you can be it. I guess, and you had uh, had part part of the practice of writing it down sort of unlocks a door that you didn't think could open maybe I'm a strong believer in that I really am and something I've said in the years following is it's actually not about achieving that goal obviously you want to achieve the goal but it's the the process on the way and what you do on the way to that goal is already more than what you would have done before and often I set these lofty goals I think it's important not to set them too lofty because you just don't try but something that you think is achievable and what you do on the way to that is amazing what you can do. And then at the end of it, you're like, oh, I didn't even know what the goal was now. I'm happy with where I'm at. And that was sort of what happened that year. And I think often happens with a lot of neo pros is that they, and it happened to me too, that you have no goals. You don't know where you're going. You come across, it's very hard. And all of a sudden you're like, I'm drowning. And the next year you do what I did. I'm happy to give up. I'm drowning. I'm out. And it's... A stroke of luck, if you do get through, something happens. Or you speak to someone that gives you that little insight to, hey, set a little goal and you never know what's going to happen. What were the two races you won? Uh, It was a race called Delta Tour of Zealand, which was a four-day race. It was a really cool race, actually. It had a cobblestone sectors around the... In Zealand, in Holland, windy. Important for Skill Shimano. Very important. Yeah. 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 It was a really cool win, actually. I'm going to talk about it because it split up in this... It was a lapse, and it split up in this sprint preem. And I happened to just make the back of this group. And then it was a group of 20 guys that went away, of all the best guys because it was a sprint preem. And Garmin, I remember, had five or six guys. They said so this big lead out, the next lap was the finish. And I was the only guy from our team there. And Garmin were doing the lead out. And I was like, happened to get on the back of Tyler Farrar. And then Brownie came up, Graham Brown, and pushed me off. And I was like, oh, I shouldn't be here anyway. Brownie, have the wheel. Next thing, we come around this corner, and those two are sprinting, and those two are so worried about each other. They're fighting, fighting. Next thing, I just come up in the slipstream and pop past them. <laughs> and I was just like, looks like I just took out the win, you know? And that was my exact reaction from the race. My teammates were like 30 seconds behind in the, in the bunch, and they were hoping that I could get some kind of points for time for GC. They're like, how'd you go? They happened to have it on camera. My, my actual reaction was, I actually just won. I can't <laughs> believe it. And they're like, I can't believe it. So... And the next race was the next week was um, a stage in route to Sud. Oh, yeah. Which was very unexpected. And I love having that on the Palmares mm. because anyone who looks at that race is just a complete mountainous race. Mm. And Lance yeah. Armstrong won that race, I think. I mean, you know. It's the big I boy mean, race. <laughs> it's the big it's boy race. It's a small race. race for the big boys. Yeah. Shoot, uh, shoot that out of the Cycling podcast, team car, the back of the pack, please. That's said PK to remind us to tell you that this episode of the Cycling Podcast is sponsored by HelloFresh. And HelloFresh are offering 50% off your first box of recipes, which will be delivered to your door. And then 35% off your next three boxes at hellofresh.co.uk with the code cycling. Um, Richard, you've been cooking from the HelloFresh recipe boxes. What's, uh, well, what have you been serving up to your family? been cooking up a storm lionel and i ordered a box with recipes for three people now one of these people is is three years old so i've done pretty well out of that because you get sort of three adult portions which is great the the favorite one that i had in my vegetarian box uh last week was the spiced moroccan lentil and chickpea soup um it was more of a a stew than a, a soup in a way but um because it was quite quite filling quite you know cling to your ribs type stuff it was great uh, lots of chickpeas tomatoes um mop it all up with a bit of pita bread lentils in there as well and it, as i say it did, did quite well out of the three portions that um were were contained in the box well if you order from hello fresh you can get as many as five meals a week for as many as five people um or as few as two people um so it's pretty versatile and the the main thing about the hello fresh boxes is 
Um, well, as the name suggests, Hello Fresh, you know you're cooking with fresh ingredients and uh, it's cooking from scratch with all the kind of the prep and the faff taken out, isn't it? Um, you're, there's nothing hidden in the recipes. You know exactly what you're cooking with uh, because it all arrives and uh, you, you can see what's in the ingredients. The, the recipe cards have got the nutritional values on, which is uh, important to people who are, you know, perhaps being health conscious about what they eat. And the other thing that um, appeals to us is that there's no no waste either. Um, you know, the, the, the boxes are portioned out so that you're getting the so kind of the right amount and uh, not, not tempted to make a huge batch that then I end up overeating by going back for seconds, thirds and fourths. I mean, they're, they're ample... Uh, portion sizes as you say rich but um you know they're uh, they're they're realistic portions so i've i've um hopefully looking after my waistline a bit in the uh, in the new year as well i'll not recognize you lionel but the and not too much packaging either um a lot of the veg and stuff are, are loose in the box there's a little bit of packaging inevitably but uh, i was quite impressed by that that uh, a lot of the a lot of the ingredients are loose um there, there are some things like like paprika it's difficult to put that loose in the box <laughs> uh, fortunately but you know the carrots and peppers and things indeed well if you would like to get 50 percent off your first hello fresh box and 35 percent off the next three go to hellofresh.co.uk and use the code cycling I mean, this all was coinciding with the time that an Australian team was coming along. I mean, they were already around at that well, point? Well, no, that was, so that was the following year. So that was sort of allowed me to get another year on my contract at Skill Shimano. Right. Because actually, I think at the end of that first year, they were thinking, what the hell, why would we sign this guy? Mm. Whose idea was this? And after that year, they're like, oh, actually, he's got a bit of go, this guy. So they're like, let's, let's extend his contract for one more year. And then I actually got my head around the classics that following year. That was at Roubaix. I finished 13th there. I got in the breakaway and went, hung on to the, the big boys when they came through and had a sprint. I was hoping for a top 10, but I finished there. Um, and then I happened I to mean, get... 13th, lucky for some. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, week, the week before, I was in the breakaway at Flanders, which was great. Big for our team. And the week before that, I was 6th in um, Gen Webergum, yeah. yeah so it was sort of like... I think Green Edge was starting up then and they were like, wow, we need a classics guy. This young Australian is going well in the classics. And I was also surprising myself at that time. And that's sort of how things happen. The team just started up at the right time and I just started finding my legs at the right time. So it's a perfect match, really. And, I mean, well, you're one of the, every generation of Australian rider up to the start of Green Edge had to do it on their own, really. I mean, there was nothing, nothing for them. They had to come to Europe and, and settle into in your case, a Dutch team, and, and work out what, what a Dutch people want. I mean, that mm. must be kind of... You talk about drowning and, and the, um, you know, the sink or swim analogy, but was there no kind of nurturing that, you know, let, let's give this guy some, you know, help? Let's Because let's, you're coming into a profession that you, you're not naturally exposed to back in Australia. It's kind of all different over here. Uh, how much nurturing is there in those environments, in those teams, when you, you're... Well, you're you're starting from quite a low base in terms of just a knowledge of the races. I mean, Ghent Wevergem. I mean, you know, have you ever been to Ghent before? Have you ever been to Wevergem before? Have you ever ridden the the Kemmelberg? I mean, all this stuff is new when you when you go there for the first time. Look, I think, and I don't want to make my story sound too hard. I think I was the last sort of generation of that make it on your own, but I still had it much easier than guys before me, like Matt Heyman, or even before me, you know, Robbie McEwen. O'Grady, Phil Anderson, those guys before me had it 20 times harder. And I'm not going to say it's easier now, but it's it's harder in a different way. It's harder now because there's a lot more competition. I think in my time, if you were able to make it over here, you just had to make it over here. Now the guys who make it over here have to deal with everyone else over here, Aussies included. But to go back to the way I sort of had it, the teams, Skill Shimano, I don't think they understood what I was going through just purely because it was foreign to them. They can't actually physically imagine what it would be like to go and, for instance, for them, go and travel to Australia, live in Australia and play Australian football, the, the sport from that country. It's too hard to imagine. So I didn't have any negative thoughts towards them because 
they just didn't know what I was going through. And it's kind of not their problem no, either. No, it's not. You know, and they did the best they could. And I think they do things a lot better now, um, Sunweb. And I want to say I was something to start there that they understood, oh, okay, this this Australian guy, you know, that doesn't work for him, this does. And they've had a lot of Australians since then. And I think they do it really well now. And I think that's been the process with a lot of teams. There's a lot of Australians coming across and they understand what it takes. They, they fly them home when they need to or help them set up over here. And, and places like Girona also help that situation. There's a lot of people who have done it before, broken the ice. When you need to get a new phone contract or simple things that actually can make or break your year, people can help you out with that stuff. Yeah, that's really interesting because, I mean, us Brits, we think that the British riders have got it tough going to somewhere where they might have to learn another language and, you know, but the simplicity of, of those things. I mean, Phil Anderson would say, well, we couldn't ring home for six months in the year maybe, you know. Um, but, yeah, if you, if you spend a fortnight trying to sort out your phone contract or that sense of being an outsider in somebody else's world, has, has that kind of left you yet or do you still get moments of that? Oh, well, definitely. Yeah, definitely. I still get it because it's, it just keeps going up a notch, you know. You get settled on your own and then my wife now came across and you're doing things together and then you get really settled and you're comfortable and then you throw a spanner in the works and you have a a child and then you have two children and then you know you just it's natural human nature you're like okay I'm comfortable let's just let's just make things uncomfortable again so it's harder on a on a new level the the simple things of like like I said getting a phone contract organizing health insurance all that crap that's easy as hell now but getting my son into school and organizing i don't know flights back to australia and when your car breaks down with two kids in the middle of nowhere getting that sorted out i know it's simple things but it's sorting that stuff out in another country and i think and i hope that when i go back to australia that sort of stuff will be a piece of cake (laughs) the thing with cycling is you really are those year to year or two year by year contract and in the start of my career, I was sort of living by that. I could be here one year, I could be here two years. There comes a point where you go, this is crap, because you're not really living. You've got the IKEA furniture in there, you've got like nothing on the walls, yada yada, and you're like, no, nah, that's it. And the thing that made me actually commit to life was I bought a turntable. I bought a turntable, bought 50 records, and I was like, you know what? That's it. I'm getting a container as in a shipping container, to take my stuff back to Australia. And once I made that commitment, I started buying furniture that I liked. I started buying paintings on the wall. And I started living here. And it started becoming my home. And so that was a big transition in my career, I think. Because when I came home, it, well, home to my apartment in Europe, it felt like home. My wife felt, com- felt comfortable at home. And whether we were here for one more year or ten more years, which we've been... It didn't matter because we're like, you know what? We have to commit to this. I think it's very hard for Australians and people coming to live here to go, I'm going to set this up like I would in my own country because ultimately I could be going home next year. But actually, if you don't do that, you will be going home next year. But also, when you go home, you'll presumably you have a little slice of your life here to take with you, whether it's a chair or a painting or, uh, you know... uh a, a selection of records. I mean, what kind of what kind of records are on the Mitch Docker turntable? Oh, there's a lot of stuff on there. Like, unfortunately, I haven't got into a massive Spanish scene, you know. But look, I'm I'm a big '80s man. You know, I like I'm a big Bowie man or Bowie. I think he wasn't that bothered about how yeah, you right. say that, was he? Bowie or Bowie? Well, I've always called him Bowie. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. We'll, <laughs> we'll have to get the pronunciation police onto that. <laughs> Look, I've got a whole array of stuff, um, but it's just been fun. This has been fun for my wife and I because it's something we both can do and we always got music on all day and my son loves, naturally has to love music because we don't watch a lot of TV here because it's in Spanish. It's just like, instead of putting the TV on, we always just put music on. And we, of course we watch cycling on TV or maybe Netflix a bit more now, but in the beginning there was no Netflix, so if you weren't downloading movies or whatever, you just weren't watching TV. So we just put music on, and the records were an awesome way to do it um, because you hear the whole album, you get to hear why the album's good, why these songs are good, why they sit this which way in the album, and 
It was awesome, man. It's just, it was fun going record shopping with my wife, you know? I loved it. Rather than the Spotify thing of just totally. selecting some tracks that don't really go together. They yeah. don't, exactly. And, and you're like, why do I like the hit? And you start listening to the album, you're like, I don't even really like the hit anymore. I mm. love this song before the hit, you know? And um, Yeah, the boring been... one in the middle takes on a new life when you have to kind of get through it to get to the second, you know, before yeah. you turn the record over. Totally. So... That's been a really fun process and um, building it up. We actually sort of got to a bit of a stalemate at the moment where, like, because in the beginning when you're building your, your collection, you're just like oh, getting this, that and everything. And then you start realising, you know what, about 20 of these records I don't really need anymore. Like, you know, what have I got there? Like, I had some vanilla ice there and, you know, some um, Pet Shop Boys. And, oh, yes, you know. Are. You, I mean... I'm, I'm, I think I'm 12 or 13 years older than you. I mean, this is the music of my youth, man. I've, I've still got them there, but, you know, like, I thought, oh, this is going to be epic, you know, and, like, they've, they've probably got played a couple of times, you know. It's funny. You're born in 86, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. People, people, there's something about the music of the, the generation just as you're born, really. Like, I... Mm. I yeah, the music that really appeals to me, like early early to mid seventies, yeah, it's funny that. I wonder what that's about. There's something, probably something quite psychological about that. Maybe well, it must be like a bit subliminal. Subliminal, yeah, it's a bit subliminal. Like maybe my son, like this is something I'm doing with the record collection now. There's no point having everything that I like, which is old, because what what is my son gonna like from that collection when he's gonna because it's gonna be super old then. For instance, it'd be like me listening to dad's stuff that he liked that was old would be like you know 1930s music I'd be like who gives a shit about that so I've got it I've been making sure I've been putting stuff from today in you, you know get, because then he will yeah. like that he's like what did you listen to dad from your time and that'll be like do you yeah. get any um, any grief on the EF bus for the music or what's the, what's the music regime on the bus well actually we came up, I came up with a really cool regime in this Vuelta because that was a, a thing Whoever puts the music on gets a lot of grief, no matter what it is. Oh, yeah, no one's going to like, at any point, you've got eight people on there, you're never going to please eight people. So the bus driver was copying a lot of grief. So I was like, I thought about it before the foils. I'm like, what are we going to do this foils are? So I was like, all right, boys, send me in your 10 top songs for this foils I made an 80-song playlist, shuffled it up, and at any moment, if you didn't like that song, you knew potentially the song, the next song could be yours. And you can always handle one crap song. Mm. It's when someone like, for instance, like Rigo's playing like a reggaeton for like an hour on end. You're like, okay, I can't <laughs> take this anymore. But if you just hear one reggaeton song, you're like, you know what? This is pretty cool. Because the next song could be like Hugh Carthy. He's got a great style of music. So that what, was a really... What's his... Uh... He had a big mix. He, had, he started off with a um, Black Sabbath song mm. from the Paranoid album. It's the instrumental song in it. It's like the second track. I can't remember the name of the track. Really good song. And originally, when he sent that list through, I heard it and I was like, oh, you've gone up a notch in my book, mate. You've gone up a notch. <laughs> and then he had some Led Zepp stuff in there. Um, Sergio Huguita had some great stuff. He had a song. Um, he had a couple of good 80s tracks. He had a, I can't think of the song, but he had a great list. Really interesting mix. Typically, Lawson Craddock had some like crazy, like, Texan like stuff. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is Were it, you do, doing the hoedown song. the hoedown in the middle of the But then he had like he finished with Gangster's Paradise and I was like, nice, nice yeah. touch. Yeah. I think it's really revealing the way people react to other people's music. Yeah. Because you know, you we have this in the cycling podcast car actually. Like um the almost a sense of uh well Richard puts the music on and um uh, there's n- yeah, there's, there's that sort of sense of if you put your stuff on. Is there going to be some comments coming here? Yeah, yeah it's hard, and you got to read it. Like, I wouldn't say I'm a DJ, but I like I like that challenge sometimes to read the crowd mm. and go, all right, what's gonna what's gonna work here? Even in a car crowd, simple as that, you know. And just like, okay, I've got the next track. This can be good. Do you have to take into account the stage that's coming up? You know, you, do, you well, don't, I don't want something... like. I really don't like doing bus DJing, right? Because I'm sort of like trying to get myself ready for the race, and there's too much going on. I can't. I actually can't be bothered trying to read the crowd. Mm. I'm just like, you know what? Put whatever on because I've got some epic stage, and I need to concentrate on it. Yeah. I 
finally put my jumper on, Mitch. It must be coming up to, well, it's got to be quarter to eight, ten to eight. There'll be some dings, ding-dongs in about ten minutes' time. What was it that made you choose Girona in the first place? Because you said you've been here since 2012. Um, probably the one of the first wave of pro cyclists from um, not from Catalonia or from Spain to actually actually come here. What was it that drew you in the first place? Look, I think <coughs> I think that there was a few people here by that point. You know, like I think Lance Armstrong was the first here in the beginning, and then you know by the time I thought about coming here, there was probably still at least you know whatever 40 pros living here so it was, it was quite busy looking in comparison to now there's quite a lot lot more um i think what attracted me here was i I lived originally in belgium for three years in a small place actually near the three point zone so i was living in a town called kelmus like calamine which is near upen which is very near belgium uh, germany and holland but what i did in those years was i broke the ice for myself Whenever I had to do something, simple stuff, I had to work it out myself. And it's renting a house. It's very, very simple stuff. Renting a house, getting a phone contract, sorting out this, that and the other. What attracted to me here, to here was there were people here who could help you. English speakers, friends. And as actually my, my wife, my partner. And I, I always say this is that I think as cyclists, we can train and do what we do in pretty much anywhere as long as there are a couple of other cyclists there because you catch up on the bike actually when you come home you don't need a lot more but my wife she was at home supporting me in Belgium when I went out riding I caught up with my mates riding and I came home I was like I'm happy to stay at home because you're here but ultimately all that time I was out riding she was there on her own so I was thinking hang on it's not all about me it's about she is a massive support for my career and if she's not happy I'm not happy so it was also about balancing that out. And then finally it came about the riding. The weather was fantastic here. Belgium, I didn't ride one day without the rain jacket in my back pocket, just in case. Here, I don't even know where my rain jacket is. <laughs> you know, oh, that's that's the literal truth. You know, it literally rains one or two days a year here when you're riding. Um, What's the riding actually like? I mean, The riding's fantastic. Yeah. You've got flat towards the coast. So you ride towards the coast in the winter because it's warmer and it's, it's very quiet. As soon as the summer comes, it's busy and it's too hot. So you go in the mountains, you go north. And then you've got great mountains. You've got big mountains. And if you go any further, you go up to Andorra, you've got proper big boys. You've got a place in Andorra as well? Yes. Look, I spend probably, we probably spend more time up in Andorra. We live up there when the weather's good. And we, we try and come down here when the weather's bad. And that's sort of how we do it because both places complement each other. Andorra is a great place to relax and do some good training. And, in, and Girona's a great place to also do good training, but to see a lot of people and just relax on a different way. When we were talking on the phone, you were talking about how, you know, the, the, the separation between family life and work life and, and taking yourself off to Andorra and doing a sort of block of a week's training and then coming back so you could be present in the family home was, was quite a, you know, a sort of watershed moment when you realised you could do it like that. It was because before that we used to all travel up there and do it together and all travel back and I think what I realised is I wasn't winning there because I was trying to train tired from helping out at home and things like that but also when I was at home I wasn't helping out that much either because I was thinking about training. So both, place, both sides of my life were crap. <laughs> for lack of a better word. Rather than when I went just on my own, I was 100% committed to my training. And when I was home, I was 100% committed to being at home. And I felt like both parties were happy. When I was there, I felt like I was sacrificing quite a lot being away from my family, so I made the most of it. I went, you know what? I'm here, I'm gonna eat well, I'm gonna train hard, because when I go home, I'm away from my family, and when I go home, I'm gonna be there, and I'm gonna be able to relax and have a beer or two with my wife and my, and my kids. Tell me about the podcast because um, you started it in 2015. I did, yep. Um, what was the? Why did you start it, and what were you? What were you trying to achieve in in those early days with it? Look, I think it's not so long ago, but I think, especially in my world, anyway, podcasts weren't a massive thing. And my brother-in-law, he was listening to some podcasts and putting me onto them. So you got to listen to this Joe Rogan. You know, this is a great podcast. I was like what is this podcast thing? So I listen to Joe Rogan. I'm like, this is awesome. And that led us on to another couple. And I had this idea. I was listening to this podcast. I'm like, you know what? It'd be a cool idea. I was talking to my brother about it. 
because I kept getting asked the same question every time I went back to Australia. What do you actually do over there? That cycling thing, you know? Where do you live? How does it all work? And I was answering the same questions every year I went back to Australia from my friends, from my family friends. So I was like, this podcast could be a great way to actually explain to people what life is like in the peloton. What do I do? Where do I live? What I do on a day-to-day basis? Really simple stuff, but explaining what I do. And it sort of got created that way. I recorded the first podcast with my friend Luke Durbridge, who's staying with me in Melbourne. I had my iPhone. I said, hey, Durbo, I've got this crazy idea about doing a podcast. I've got no idea how to do it. Do you want to come up upstairs where it's a bit quieter? And let's just record something. We're not going to use it. Let's just record something and just practice talking to each other with a microphone. I released that one, of course. (laughs) Yeah, that's what we always (laughs) say. Oh, we won't use this. Don't worry. (laughs) And that's pretty much where it was born. Um, Durbo's been a, a constant member on there. And what is it you get from it? Because it's, a, it's really evolved on from those, those early kind of slightly, slightly rough and ready recordings. It's, it's developed a style of its own. I mean, has that been a conscious thing or has that just been something you've learned along the way? It's something I've learned along the way. Um, look, my brother is, he's in media and he's, got, he's a television producer and he's, he's a master interviewer. And whether I know it or not, I think I've taken a lot from him just listening to him and being around him. And I'm just very intrigued talking to people. Um, And that's just how it's happened. I really only speak to people I'm interested in. And I'm more or less picking their brain for my own knowledge. And it just comes out a great story on the podcast. You know, everyone I speak to, I'm asking questions I genuinely want to know myself. I think what's happened is that's happened in the Peloton anyway. And I thought, hang on, maybe more than just myself would want to hear this. Maybe we should record some of this as well. What's the reaction been from people over the years? It's actually been quite surprising. I didn't know that a lot of people would be as interested as I would about the general stuff. And I really haven't tried to break any goss or big stories. I really just want to talk about what makes people tick. And that's been interesting. And sometimes I'm surprised stuff that I don't find that interesting, a lot of people find very interesting. And vice versa, stuff that I find very funny and interesting, people don't find interesting. So it's it's a real learning experience for me just to let the people I'm talking to tell their story. And the people listening will like some of it and won't like some of it. And that's what I love about it is it's really, every story is very different. Do you think you've uh, developed a style that you can kind of you know, put your finger on and say, yeah, that's, that's how I do it. That's what I'm looking for when I sit down to talk to someone? I actually notice it when I'm talking to someone about five, ten minutes into the conversation. I should get this guy on the podcast. I just, I'm interested in them. And I'm noticing that when I'm just talking to people, I'm noticing what I'm doing. I probably did it before the podcast. I'm asking people a lot of questions about what they do. I'm like, hang on, we should have a microphone recording this. This is awesome. Whereas I was doing this years before and not thinking like that. I think I'm just an inquisitive person and just interested to hear about people's stories I I really love hearing people's stories because everyone's got an interesting story and being relating to their struggles so what's um what's in the next phase of life in the peloton well that's a big question it is a big question I think I think it's taking it up a notch and well I think we can break it here can we not we can break it here one thing you said to me early on in this podcast was I was amazed that you could speak to me after the race coming in on such a day at the bus and this is something I always say about my podcast is that there's a reason why people drop their guard after about 10-15 minutes is they've got to connect to the person they're speaking to and that was something that happened with you and you and I the day before we did an interview about Marcel Kittle and I remember getting hit up about that interview on the bus and they said oh there's an interview cycling podcast you know outside and I was like oh all right let's do it but after about one or two minutes, there was a connection. And we, got a, we had a great conversation. And I was happy to talk to you and it was done. The next day I saw you, like you said, I had, no, I had no problem talking to you and connecting and just going for it. After a hard day, a shitty day, and that was maybe why that story came out because it was a connection. So I think maybe that's why when you spoke to me about, hey, we should do something together. The cycling podcast meets life in the peloton. I thought... You're someone I really connected to from the start and I would really like to see where this, 
the Life in the Peloton could go with the cycling podcast. So that that's the next step for Life in the Peloton. Well, Mitch, we're going to find out. Yeah. We're going to find out. I'm, I'm going to ask you to critique my technique now as a, as a podcaster. I mean, what, what do you reckon? Have I got a future in this? I reckon so. <laughs> you, your beer ordering is very up to scratch. <laughs> Already when I was thinking, let's get another beer, you said, can we get another beer? So I was like, you're one step ahead of me. That's perfect. Well, it's the off season. I mean, we're allowed, aren't we? I think it's a crucial thing. Like Probably 80% of my podcasts always have a beer because there's that, that element of relaxation. And that's something people always ask me about. What do you like drinking beer about? I said, obviously, it's about drinking the beer. I do like the beer part of it. But there's something about drinking an alcoholic drink that just sets the scene. If you go, okay, let's have a glass of water. Everyone's a little bit stringent, you know what I mean? It's actually not about the alcohol. In the end, it probably is. It's about the social it's about, social as- exactly. aspect of it, isn't it? You know what I mean? You know, it's like, I love having a beer or a glass of wine with my wife because it means we can just sit down and chat. If we didn't have that drink, would we sit down and chat? It wouldn't be the same. I still chat to my wife. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, but you know what I mean. It's something about that, that beverage that says, let's just relax. And people forget that they're being recorded. I mean, we're holding microphones, but I've kind of forgotten that we're recording this. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, well, that's, um, that's what I'm looking forward to from Life in the Peloton. And we will, we will find out in the coming weeks exactly what uh, you've got in store, Mitch. See, my joint's sort of back over this way. So you're just outside, just outside the, the town itself? I live right next to the soccer stadium. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah, which is like about 2k out. Have you ever been to see them? I was supposed to go last weekend, but in the end, my wife organised a barbecue and I was like, God damn it, it's the one game. I'm going to miss it. It's every two weeks, as you know. So, I missed. But it's pretty easy to get tickets. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, we're off to Barcelona tonight. Yeah, I know. I heard you say that yesterday. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, I think it should be, yeah, it should be quite good. What's that, sorry, Mitch? That's Rocket Corber over there. Two towers on the top. And unofficially... Ryder hazardell has got the record up there, I guess. And, you know, there's about 20 people who claim got the record. Hazardell, Dan Martin. Miller reckons he's got a good one up there. Woodsy. But I think the official record goes to Noxie. James Knox. I'm pretty close up there too. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. I've done 33 minutes up there. And I think those guys do, like, maybe 27 minutes or something. It's a fair bit different, isn't it? How many times a year would you ride it? Is it just for testing or would you go up there just for, just because it's there? Yeah, I'd probably do it like twice a year. Not for testing, it's too steep. It's, just an, it's actually quite a nice ride. It's broken up into two halves. The first half is quite nice and then there's a flat bit and then it just gets pretty gnarly all the way to the top. But a really good view at the top, close to town too. So you can just ride there, get... Some guys actually go there and if, if they've got like a, I don't know, 4,000 altitude metre day... I might go, you know what, I'm just going to go and do five reps of Rocket Corba. And just quickly on uh, your plans over the winter for, you know, go back and start training, tour down under, and then the, you'll do the Sun Tour as well, home race? Yeah, the Sun Tour is a special race for me, and I think for a lot of Australians, because that was a race I sort of cut my teeth in and always looked up to. Like when I was growing up, the Sun Tour was the race that I went down and bought my kit from, from the old pros. Can you in, remember what you got? I got a big big matte skin suit from Jeremy Hunt, long sleeve skin suit. And as a pro now, they're the things you're just like, who the hell's ever going to buy a long sleeve skin suit and use it? I was that guy and I love that skin suit. I think I've still got it today because it would be super retro now. Anyway, I went down there and <clears throat> once I saw all those guys, I was like, wow, the Sun Tour, that's a big deal. And then when I first I first rode it with Simon Gerrans, he brought out the AG2R team and I stagiaired with them. So that was also a massive thing as well. One, the Sun Tour, and two, riding on AG2R with proper pros. I was like, whoa. So to go back and do the Sun Tour every year, it's got that specialness. It's a different race completely now, start of the year after Tour Down Under. It's actually, I think, much harder. Cadell Evans before, which is also a really good race. I like that race. Um, and tour, tour down under before that. So it's actually a pretty big block in Australia. 
the Sun Tour back in those days would have been the November slot rather than February. So I think Jeremy Hunt was fa- fairly famous for taking all of his season's kit down there to sell. So it's a bit of a like a car boot sale or a garage sale, as uh, you probably call it. It was, yeah. And the first few times I did it, I did the same thing too. It was quite cool. You'd take all your kit, open your suitcase, and it's a win-win, I see that, because you got a bit of cash for the summer. Kids and whoever, adults who went down there, me included... You got cheap kit, and who was really complaining? You know, like you're just flogging off whatever you could sell for like 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there. You couldn't buy that stuff anywhere for that price. So I always saw it as a win win. No one was, no one was um, losing out. You'll be buying all your stuff back on eBay in future years when nostalgia hits, I can guarantee you. I've got all my stuff still. <laughs> Not all of it, but I've kept a lot of it because I'm aware of that. I'm aware of the. The kit, it doesn't take long. It takes like about, I reckon I'll get out in my, um, well, definitely Skill Shimano stuff. That's super retro now, and I'm glad I've got a, a lot of that stuff. So, Did you know that, like the Skill Shimano kit, have you got the one that was uh, the, 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 the kind of remake of the 1980s, the famous uh, Sean Kelly era skill from yeah. when they sponsored before? Yep, I've got that kit. It's the, the blue and red. And then the last year I was in it, it went all white, but they still kept the blue and red stripes, so... Um, it's pretty good, pretty good. Is that uh, something that, you, you know, the, the riders, uh, when the new kit comes out, you think, oh, I've got to wear this all year. I mean, um, certainly the EF stuff, I was thinking, chimes with your 80s vibe, the, okay. the swirling pink and blue, purple, magenta, whatever it, whatever it is. How would you describe it? It's, I reckon it's got a bit more of a 90s feel, sort of like that, that skater 90s feel. Um, and that's what, they, what I heard they based it off. But I was... I was unbelievably happy when I saw that kit because typically you get a kit, well, this is the way I sort of saw it, and you're trying to make small adjustments to it yourself to make it fit your style, you know, wear it this way or maybe alter the sleeve this way or something like that. But when the EF stuff came out, I was I was just genuinely happy to have that kit to wear myself. I was like, I can't believe my own team kit is something I would just go out and buy and be completely happy with. So sweet. I think it's based on sort of the. Do you remember those global thermo colour T-shirts that used to change colour with body temperature? Yeah. I, I, I know of it. I know of them. I never had one. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's something to get looking on eBay yeah. for. <laughs> now, as we were walking around, uh, made a, a saw a barber shop and just uh, joked whether that's where you get your hair cut. And you, and you said you cut your own hair. I mean, I I didn't want to make a kind of a, a feature of the moustache and, and the haircut, but. It, it, it's a it's a state it's a statement moustache and haircut right <laughs> um yeah like i had a mullet when i first turned pro and that was a bit of just a joke thing i just shaved the top of my head and the mullet grew and i actually shaved the back of my mullet off my first year pro because i was like i'm struggling here this hairstyle's not working for me maybe if i shave my mullet i'll start riding good no it didn't really work but and everyone after that said to me, just get the mullet back. And I was like, well, it's not a two-second thing. You know, it takes a good year to grow it back. It took probably, I don't know, five, six years before I started growing it back again. And the mo happened after my crash in Roubaix. Um, I couldn't shave because my face was all done up. And I could shave just the sides of my face. And I had to leave my moustache because I cut my lip. I forgot to say that. I cut my lip. And so I left the mow there until the stitches came out. And then after about a month or so, I had this big mow and I looked exactly like my dad, who's got a mow. And everyone sort of was like, mow's cool, man, you know, and it, it sort of caught on and it's been hard to get rid of it, actually, because everyone's like, where's the mow, you know? Now, are, are there any other mullets that you've admired in cycling? I'm thinking of like Shane Archbold, who on the track was nicknamed the Flying Mullet for a while, I think. Um, Lauren Brochard, former world champion, had a pretty um, distinctive mullet. Any others, can you think? Vladimir Carpets. Cool. I did like Carpets as a mullet. Flying Carpets, yeah. yeah. And you know, the Flying Mullet, he's definitely an inspiration too, but his is a whole other realm. That's a proper big boy mullet. I try to keep mine a little, you know... Time. Well, Mitch, thanks for the guided tour of Girona. It's been a great morning. Um, went up onto the 
the old wall around the town. Lovely coffee. It's been checking out some of the cycling shops and, and uh, cafes owned by the cyclists. You've told me about the end of season pub crawl that uh, well we'll have to keep that secret from the listeners I think um, but uh, it sounds sounds um, well it sounds like a sort of six mountain grand tour stage in terms of endurance but it's time to look forward to 2020 and um, let us know what you have in store or what, what you'd like to do with life in the peloton in 2020. I want to push the boundaries a little bit with life in the peloton next year and with the help of the cycling podcast, I think we're going to be able to, for me anyway, personally, venture into those people I've wanted to speak to for a few years. And, you know, top of the tree is sort of Tom Boonen. There's a guy I was looking at as a professional riding with him, a guy I really admired. He's a champion of the races that I love, the classics. And I think would just be a great guy to talk to. Um, and I would love to have a chat to him this year or next year. Um, I also want to get back and revisit some of my, my favourite guests guests along the way. I'd love to have another chat with Marcel Kittle and how he's going along with his stage of life now. But also, again, I still want to touch base with a lot of people who have got interesting stories. And I haven't made a big list yet, but it always happens with Life in the Peloton. I'm riding along, I'm chatting with someone in the Peloton, and I in- instinctively think, I've got to get you on the pod. So plenty more podcasts coming up and a lot of exciting stories. What I want to do too is some mini series along the way during the Grand Tours, depending what Grand Tour I'm riding next year. Get those stories. I really love that feeling and hearing how my teammates or riders in the race transition over the race. That's something I really enjoy and the challenge of doing it myself on the race. It breaks me away from the the day-to-day grind and allows me to think about something else. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Do you think there's almost an element of kind of therapy in doing the podcast, having a conversation with another rider, sharing those experiences and and, and peeling away the layers a little bit of of what it is you do for a living? There is. And like I said, it does break me out of the Grand Tour grind or the race grind or even just my life as a cyclist grind. It allows me to think about something else and challenges me a bit, but it's it's not overly challenging. It's, it's It's a very enjoyable thing. And like I've said a lot of times is that I learn so much from every podcast. Every person I talk to has something really interesting to say. And I take something out of every podcast for myself and think, wow, that's a really interesting way of doing it. I'm going to try that. As we heard there, we're delighted to welcome Mitch's podcast, Life in the Peloton, to the Cycling Podcast channel. The first new episode will be Mitch's conversation with fellow EF Education first rider Jimmy Whelan, who talks about the experience gained during his first year as a pro. That will be released on January the 29th, and just as before, Life in the Peloton will air once a fortnight or thereabouts during the season. If you're a loyal Life in the Peloton listener, don't worry, we're not going to mess with a popular format. We're just going to free Mitch up so he's got more time to concentrate on delivering more great episodes. If you've not heard Mitch's podcast before, we'll be running a series of six edited versions of our favourites over the course of the coming week. So look out for them on the feed. We'll hear from Theo Gagan-Hart, Luke Durbridge, Marcel Kittle, Swain Tuft, Mike Woods and Daryl Impey, and you'll get a flavour of Mitch's style in those episodes. Next week, Richard Daniel and I will return to discuss the green shoots of the 2020 racing season. And in the meantime, Lizzie Banks and Tom Wally return with Service Course, our tech show that's so much more than a tech show. That will be released later this week. Finally, we've relaunched our Friends of the Podcast series with a new easy-to-use system. There's loads to listen to already. Last week, as a bonus, we added Daniel's episode from last year, telling the story of Marco Haller and Bernie Eisel's recoveries from serious injuries. Eisel has, of course, just announced his retirement. There's loads more to come over the course of the year, and it's just £15 to sign up. We've frozen the price. If you pay a little more, we'll send you a signed copy of our latest book, The Grand Tour Diaries. Sign up as a friend at thecyclingpodcast.com slash subscribe. Your support is hugely important. We couldn't do what we do without it, as it means we can continue to cover the Grand Tours and create our spin-off shows. So I'd like to thank the following friends of the podcast. Mark Cooney, Gary Bondi, Stuart Lang, Finbar O'Halloran, Niall Porter, 
John Fowley, Thomas Postle, Mike Hewison, Julian Ormerod and Paul Bailey. And thanks from me to Neil McCulloch, Michael Hennessy, Gareth Maloney, Wayne Prescott, Thomas Ross, David Drury, Dale Nelson, Len Anderson, Mark Taylor, Ben Malone and Helen Dent. 